And that's what's really alarming to me. I think mm-hmm. a lot of people, younger people right now, seem very willing to trade freedom for a greater sense of safety, yeah. which is the hallmark of any tyrannical authoritarian regime. They will take your freedom and they'll give you safety in exchange. Mm-hmm. No, thank you. Yeah. That's not a that's not a country I want to live that's in. That's not a trade I'm willing to no, make. No, not at all. Fasten your seatbelt. Did you have an opinion on COVID? Did you have to leave your job because of it? On today's episode, I'm sitting down with Jennifer Say, who has quite the story. Um, not only was she an Olympic athlete, she is a filmmaker and an author. She's recently written a book called Levi's Unbuttoned, and we get to sit down and talk about her career path with the uh, very famous company Levi's and uh, what ultimately led to her leaving. Let's get to it. Jennifer Say is with us today. And you are an author of a book that we all, well, our entire team just got our hands on, uh, Levi's Unbuttoned. And it's an amazing book. Thank Thank you so much for writing it. Um, We'll obviously go into more detail on that. But what is your background? Well, I have done a lot of different things in my life. (laughs) And we can talk about all of them, but I'll give you the sort of short version. Um, I had an unusual childhood. I was an elite gymnast. I was on the national team for seven years, and I was the 1986 national champion. So I have a whole part of my life that's kind of that Mm -hmm. and what emanated from that, which wasn't the best. So (laughs) there's that. Um, I also um, am a business leader and I guess now former executive. Mm -hmm. I, um, I spent about 23 years at Levi Strauss and Company and worked my way all the way up from entry level marketing assistant to brand president. Which is impressive, I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> and very unusual. I mean, it wasn't my first job, but certainly I spent the better part of my adult life mm-hmm. and professional career at one company, which is pretty unusual now. It's unheard of, yeah. Yeah, no one does it. Yeah. Um, and then I'm a writer and filmmaker as well. So this is my second book, Levi's Unbuttoned, mm-hmm. which uh, came out just a few months ago. But I wrote one back in 2008 about... Um, my experience as a gymnast. Mm-hmm. And I made a documentary film uh, that came out in 2020 called Athlete A, mm-hmm. uh, which really documents um, basically the abuse of culture in the sport of right. gymnastics. And I, I think in this, in the current book or the most recent book, yeah. uh, you really did a great job. I guess I just want to commend you on on telling such a complete story. Because initially when I first got into it, I'm like, oh, we're going way back. Yeah. But I very quickly saw the themes you were creating uh, through through basically just all of your experiences and that how that <laughs> that makes me really happy. <laughs> well, and but how it's led to such a this moment that has happened for you, uh, you know, in response to the 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 COVID pandemic or and the the changes that we're starting to see in corporate America, yeah, um, and probably just in culture in general, yeah. But we were talking about this and you really see, at least in the book, you seem to walk away with just like you had some closure. You personally took the closure. I don't know if they gave it to you, but you decided to just close it out in your mind and you just moved on in a way. And I wondered, yeah. nah. you didn't see. Should I tell what happened? Do people? We like, should probably. Should I-, <laughs> I mean, I'll do the short version just so people understand. Yeah. No, yeah. let's. Well. You you touched on the gymnastics things and yeah. the filmmaking, which came as a product of the gymnastics yeah. experience, but then moved into this whole other realm of marketing. And yeah, and there's overlap there; they're not absolutely. sequential. But yeah, I mean, I I started the company as an entry level marketer, moved up the ladder, became the CMO, was a beloved employee. Mm-hmm. You know, I was a really committed coach and leader. I wanted to help people build meaningful careers that they loved. Um, and I was successful as mm-hmm. a CMO, helped the company company go public. Um, and I was respected for my outspokenness in the world of gymnastics, even though, interestingly, I had tried to keep all of that hidden because mm-hmm. um, I felt like I never wanted my commitment question. So the fact that I had these side projects, you know, a uh-huh. book, like I kept it. Not because I thought they would disagree with the content, but because I thought they might question my commitment to the company. And. I felt like I never wanted to be in a position where I was maybe on the cusp of being promoted, but somebody said, well, Jen's not as committed as he is. She's got these other side gigs. Mm -hmm. And that's a real 
thing that that might have been said yeah, at, at a certain point, you know, um, or she's got a bunch of kids and she's the second earner and it's not as important. I was never the second earner. I was always the first. But these are real things that happen. Or assumptions you know? and things people. Yeah. They don't want you to have a hobby outside of work. They would right. like you to be 100%. All here all the time. Right. So I kept those things secret. Once my book came out in 2008, I couldn't keep it secret right. anymore. And it was interesting. It was another really pivotal moment for me because it people respected me more mm. when the book came out as a leader, as someone, you know, creative with some vision and, you know, with a voice and courage. So that moment was like a turning point moment for me too to bring kind of more of myself to work mm. and just to really be who I was which is what was my undoing <laughs> at the end of the day because what happened is in, in 2020 in March of 2020 I was outspoken about school closures yes. and all of the restrictions to children closed mm. playground playgrounds in San Francisco were closed for yeah. nine months um, two-year-olds were masked in preschool so I kept my advocacy to children because I thought that was a bridge building and that's that's a theme for you. I mean, I think yeah. I think the um, athlete A was, you know, that was a you were an advocate for children. Yeah. So it wasn't out of character that you no. would have found the same topic. And I pointed that out, mm -hmm. you know, to those who told me to stop. Um, it wasn't I, I say that I focused on children only to say that I was opposed to lockdowns mm -hmm. in more broadly. I was opposed to all of the various mandates more broadly. I didn't really speak as much on those things. Um, I thought that by focusing on children, mm -hmm. I could help kind of bridge the divide. Well, who, no one was speaking for them in those. Yeah. Ways. And who wants to harm children? It just sort of seemed like the... Um, the obvious. The bridge <laughs> issue, you know, it, it just seemed like something we could get to some agreement on. Yeah. Like, who wants to harm children? Apparently, lots of people don't care mm -hmm. if children are harmed. Um, so I kept my, you know, advocacy and outspokenness to that. And about six months in, and what that looked like was, yes, social media, but there were other things. I wrote op-eds. I eventually mm -hmm. appeared on local news and then eventually on a national news show. Um, I led rallies to get open schools, to get schools open, uh, which didn't work. Mm -hmm. They did not open. <laughs> um, and somewhere in the fall of 2020, uh, I got my first call from a peer saying people are angry they don't like what you're saying mm -hmm. i said why should i care yeah. <laughs> why does that matter yeah. um you need to think about what you say when you speak you speak on behalf of the company and mm -hmm. i said i don't i'm a mom with four kids and at this point in the fall of 2020 all the private schools were opening in san francisco right. so this peer who called me was sending her children to in-person private and telling me that i could not advocate for the same for the public school children of San yeah. Francisco. I was like, the hypocrisy are you was insane? so bad. Yeah. It was so like blatantly obvious. It's like you don't get to to say that like we got to continue these policies when the most underserved children in your community and this is on the heels of the summer of 2020 when these same peers are pledging their commitment to equality of opportunity and denouncing their own white privilege mm -hmm. yet when it when the rubber hit the road they fully availed themselves of right. that white privilege to send their own children to in-person private while telling me and others like me, you cannot advocate right. for low-income children, black children, to have what your children Right. Have. And that side also attaches that racism title to things. And I thought that, that was so – I mean, I remember that. It was like – you could be labeled a racist if you were promoting going back to school. And yet I was like, there is like a logical argument for the for this to go the completely other way. Like it is the opposite. You're, these are there. And you uh, I was so glad you highlighted it. Like these are children that a lot of them, they're f getting fed by the school through programs. They're being they're they're home alone because their parents, per they're not white collar workers like me, mm -hmm. you know, in office jobs. Their parents might be hourly wage workers who work at, I don't know, the grocery store. Mm -hmm. They're not staying home with these kids. Very young children yeah. were left home by themselves to navigate or not mm -hmm. Zoom school. Mm -hmm. Homeless children. Yeah. Where are they? Yeah. What are they supposed to do? Um, you know, the older children are left to care for the younger children and not tend to their own schooling. Right. 
don't have strong Wi-Fi, not getting food, social services that yeah. these kids receive at school, well, and mental then health services. You think about like the possibility of like the increased amount of abuse that could be happening. And there's in the no home. intervention. You there's know, no. in the early days, if you're saying, oh, reports of abuse are going down, that's good. No, no. <laughs> Hmm. reports were going down because there was no one to see it and intervene right. because that's most often teachers right. who are mandatory reporters. So it was just going unnoticed and unseen. Which it is devastating. I wonder, I mean, you hope that it's not the case, but like, what are we going to see come out of this, you know, as, as time, as we move away from this period? I think there's been, uh, to finish the story, I know, no, I'm sorry. I, I, it, was, <laughs> that's okay. it was two years of me saying we need to, protect the children. We need kids to have their lives back. And eventually, you know, the long and short of it is I didn't stop. And then I was told I had to leave mm -hmm. the company um, in January of 22. And I didn't take the severance or hush money. And I have been talking about it ever since. And mm -hmm. that's what the book's about, because I think the suppression of debate and dissent and the censorship and the illiberalism mm -hmm. inside of America's wokest companies mm -hmm. is really frightening to me and is antithetical to democracy. So I wanted to be able to speak about it. You just did a great job telling the story of how it all kind of makes sense now, or yeah. or you see the value of these maybe not so pleasant experiences you've had through your history. Right. How it all added up. And it makes, yeah, it gave you kind of, I don't know, it, that experience. I love, I love as, as we get older, <laughs> the, one of the blessings of getting older is you start going, oh, I see why that happened. Right. Or I see where that helped me now. Yeah. And that was what I wanted to do. And it, it, I'm, I'm glad you, that's, a, that makes me really happy oh, that you say that. <laughs> because for me, I, I love memoir, first of all, and I draw, I don't like self-help. I used to have this in the book, but it, it came out. Um, but I do think books can be helpful. Mm -hmm. I think self-help as a genre, it annoys me. I don't, like it. I find it sort of saccharine and too pat. Mm. But I get a lot of inspiration from memoirs, triumph over adversity, like how did a person draw strength in a particular situation? Mm. How do they overcome obstacles? And I like memoir that gives me a peek inside a world that I don't really know about. And yet I can find, um, draw comparisons to my own life. Yeah. You know, I find them to be really interesting and inspiring. So that's what I wanted to do. And I think, you know, I had a lot of back and forth because some people wanted this book to be about COVID only mm -hmm. and my dissenting around COVID, which we can we can talk about. But I thought it was important to paint the picture in terms of my background. If I wanted people to be able to draw inspiration from this, I think the part of my life that is gymnastics, I mean, I started a deficit in mm -hmm. terms of being able to kind of find the courage to use my voice and to stand up um, mm -hmm. to untruths and to um, to harmful practices. I mean, gymnastics is like, it instilled such obedience in me. You had to be silent. Mm -hmm. Gymnasts were seen but not heard. And that's how I left the sport at 19, you know, anxious, depressed, and lacking any and mm -hmm. all self-esteem. And so for me to find the courage to stand up to what I saw as tremendous injustice to defend children. It's not an easy thing. Mm -hmm. And so my point is to say, if I can do it, mm -hmm. you can do it too. That's why I thought the backstory was important. And you uh, you accomplished that because I think it was empowering. And I, and I will also add, I think, and we kind of mentioned it earlier, I kind of come from a, a different political, maybe um, cultural perspective on things. Um, and I know we kind of joked about earlier that like we've all kind of meshed in the middle yeah. a little bit. We're all coming those together. With common sense, have. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it, um, I loved. I mean, at the end of the book, I was like, it was, it was so powerful for me, me particularly, to hear all of those details, because I'm as I'm morphing into this open-minded has such a negative connotation, but like, or not a negative, but. I want to be able to hear different perspectives, sure. whether I agree or not. Yeah. I want to hear them. And I really want to listen yeah. to these voices. So by you telling all of your experiences, I felt like I could relate so much to you. And yet on paper, society would say, I shouldn't relate to you. Right. And I was like, oh, I, I love that. It just humanized every bit of your story oh, so much. And so it, it made it something that I think 
as I'm kind of going through this journey of wanting to just, I want to hear all the sides. These can't, you know, the other side, may, it may be an opposition to me, but it doesn't mean that we can't find common There's ground. no good. Yeah. There's no, well, of course they can't all be just, they're evil, I'm good. It That's, doesn't make any sense. I was told in January of 2022 by the person that, you know, helped accelerate my yeah. career that there was no place for me at the company anymore. I think he became weary of this very vocal minority complaining and he sort of gave in and mm -hmm. here's where the sort of lack of moral well, courage yeah. and courageous leadership comes in. I think he had the head of human resources and the head of corporate communications telling him she is a threat. She is damaging our corporate reputation. She is employees don't like her. Right. And I, it's not true. Yeah, there were a small number mm -hmm. who were behaving in an irrational manner. They were right. angry and didn't want me there anymore. But, you know, I just don't understand why a leader wouldn't stand up and say, hey, you're all aware of the things that Jen is advocating for. You may not agree, and that's okay. She has the right to use her voice. You have the right to use yours. Let's let's get back to work. Mm -hmm. There's nothing more to say on this subject. Right. It it would have literally been that simple. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would point to an example, and it's like the only one I've seen in the last couple of years in terms of corporate leadership that quelled the angry mob. Mm -hmm. the, the CEO of Netflix, mm -hmm. Ted Sarandos, was under a lot of pressure, a lot, local, tiny minority of employees, to pull the closer Dave Chappelle's right. special off the platform. Now, it was one of the most watched shows. So from a commercial perspective, he didn't really want to pull it. Right. You know, it was one of the most watched and most favorably reviewed, if you mm. look at Rotten Tomatoes, right. you know, by regular folks. Right. But, you know, 40 or 50 employees were angry and wanted it removed because they saw the content as anti-trans. He said, sorry, you feel this way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're going to show a lot of content for a lot of different kinds of people. We appeal to a broad audience. Mm -hmm. If you don't like that, then maybe this is not the place for you to work. Yeah. And it was over. Yeah. It was done. Nobody left as far as I know. Yeah. Or if they did, it was not a mass exodus. So mm -hmm. maybe a handful of employees left and they got back to work. Mm -hmm. So, but I think most CEOs have not spoken in their own voice for so long. Yeah. You know, they read the talking points that the CorpCom people and the HR people write for them. They don't even know what they think anymore. Mm -hmm. So if they have those two positions screaming at them, this is what you have to do. That's what they do. What are your thoughts on because like that influence from the outside or, the, or those small minorities in the companies that, you know, get real loud and, yeah. and maybe frighten some people as yeah. like, ah, oh, this is going to mess stuff up. Yeah. Like, I know a lot of the criticism was like, you represent the company, your tweets, you yeah. know, you need to be careful because you're saying things that don't, you know, toe the company line of, of, what, yeah. of what we're about. I do, and another thing I don't have an answer for, but I just wonder, since you lived such a personal yeah. experience with that, I mean, I am, our freedom of speech is a, just an, a, a such a massive part of us as Americans and this beautiful privilege that we were born into yeah. um, as citizens. And um, I know we probably don't value it as much until moments like this where you're like, I'm allowed to have a different opinion. Yeah. And I'm allowed to speak this different opinion without being strung up in the square. Yeah. Um, because this is America. This is what we, you know, why we were one of the pillars we were founded on. And that's the... I mean, that is the definition of the problem of the time that we are living in. It used to be you could just disagree with people. You had friends and neighbors you disagreed with. You might have a lively conversation over, you know, drinks. Um, now, if you disagree, the other side is painted as evil. Yeah. And they cannot be spoken to. They must be dismissed and they must be banished. How did we end up here? And if you take it to, you know, literally the political binary and political parties, if you and this is basically what happened to me, if you challenge a single tenant of the party that you thought was your cohort, you challenge one aspect of it. And I now challenge more. But if you do dare to challenge one aspect by asking simple questions you're a heretic and yeah. you must be banished and you are considered to be 
evil and on the other. I mean, the things I was called for simply <laughs> saying, are we sure that closing schools is the right thing to do? Yeah. I was like QAnon, mm -hmm. which I didn't even know what that was. <laughs> and I don't even think it's real. I mean, I think it's like a made up figment of people's imagination for the most part. Um it, it doesn't even make any sense, you know, and right. you, you say, are we sure this is right? Is it effective? Is it harmful? Are we hurting children? Mm -hmm. And you're a racist. You're a fat phobe. You're uh, a eugenicist. Mm -hmm. You're anti-union. You're anti-trans. Like these things, you're like, how do we even get here from that? But it's like you challenge one thing and you are just all the yeah. other bad things. Yeah. And it's like we got here slowly as a country and then I think suddenly all at once mm. in the last sort of five to seven mm -hmm. years. And it's untenable as a way to move forward. So I make it a point <laughs> to try to find that common ground with people because we can come from very different backgrounds. And I'm still there sure a lot we agree on mm -hmm. and there's probably plenty we disagree on. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. That's Yeah. Well, and I, I don't ever want to live in a world where it's just one way. Like I think as – as, <laughs> As humans, we know we make mistakes. We sure. know we have, you know, um, isolated perspectives of yeah. things. And it's like, you know, I may not, I have only lived in my shoes. Right. I have no idea right. what the other person, right. what experiences. And again, back to your book is, is you kind of highlighting all of those experiences in a very appropriate way where it makes sense to the where you're at today and what you're dealing with. Yeah. Or the challenges I think that you were, especially in those final months yeah. at Levi, where you were... I don't know, from the book, it, I felt the like, you don't want to do this. Like, don't make, don't. Yeah. The history you had with that company and the love you had for not only, you know, your fellow coworkers, but the brand that yeah. you had really, to do your job well, you really had fallen in love with this brand. I did. Yeah. and that's I mean, I'd loved it since I was a kid or I'd worn it, you know. Mm. I, I was a reluctant member of corporate America. It wasn't what I wanted to do, you know, when I was a young 20 something, like, you know, some people, that's what they want. I was very hesitant to embark on that. I wanted to pursue more creative endeavors. And but I wanted to be able to support myself. I'm a practical person. I did not want to ask my parents for help. And I, you know, took a job, an advertising agency at a fairly young age. And was good at it and it was fun and I just kind of kept going and then life happens, right? You have mm -hmm. kids and you got it. And so, you know, I always have been this reluctant corporate executive, but I, or corporate person, ultimately executive, um, but I knew if I was gonna work in that world, it had to be for a brand mm -hmm. that I actually used and loved. And I'd worn Levi's since I was six years old. Mm -hmm. Um, I had many great memories of Levi's. I traveled to Moscow in. Um, I love you. Have to tell that story. Yeah, I will. Um, in in 1986, I almost forgot the year. Um, I was a member of the U.S. national team, and as a response to all the Olympic boycotts, because if you recall, there was you know the boycott in 1980. Um, and that the U.S. boycotted the Olympics mm -hmm. in 1980 that were in Moscow. And then in 1984, the Russians boycotted the Olympics mm -hmm. as a response that were in Los Angeles. And so Ted Turner created this rogue style Olympics competition called the Goodwill Games. I don't even know if it exists anymore. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not really sure. Anyway, the first one was in Moscow in 1986. So this is before the wall came down. Mm -hmm. So I was like a ranking member of the national team. I think I was... I guess I was ranked number one because I had won the national championship. So I'm on this team. We are going to Moscow. I'm 17 years old. And uh, at the time, the Russians are the best gymnasts in the world, like mm. by a long shot. It's not even close. Okay. Like they win everything they had for 20, 30 years. So I'm enamored of, you know, of, of these athletes. Like right. I'm honored that I even get to be on the same floor and like carry their beam shoes. <laughs> um, so... It was a common practice for international teams to sort of trade leotards and pins and things like that. That's what you did. So I brought, I was told, bring Levi's mm -hmm. to trade. That's what the Russian gymnasts want. They're a symbol of, it wasn't said this way, but, you know, the best of what America stands mm -hmm. for. 
you know, freedom and progress and inclusion and all of these optimism. That's that's what Levi's really stood for, which I think most people have a sense of that mm-hmm. that that is the case, although we can talk about how that may or may not have changed. So I brought I went to the mall with my mom and I bought all these very tiny 501s and I brought them to Moscow and traded leotards, you know, sweats, pins. So I feel like I got the better end of the deal. I brought home all this cool stuff yeah. but i think it's just illustrative of the fact one it's a great levi's story it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, um and two it's illustrative of the fact of sort of what levi's has meant around the world mm-hmm. you know freedom and rugged individualism and all of these things but i worked there because i loved the product and i loved the brand and i loved the culture mm-hmm. frankly and the things i didn't like about the culture as i moved up i was able to sort of impact and start to shift mm-hmm. and you know one of the things i write about it was a very male dominated culture in the 90s and 2000s mm-hmm. and that was challenging mm-hmm. you know i'm talking you know sales meetings with like drunken sales guys making you know advances like that's just sort of what it was um i had my first child in 2000 and came back from a very short maternity leave Mm because no one had any and um i was uh i don't know if it's too personal but it's in the book i was pumping still when i came back after four weeks and the facility that we were provided with was like a closet with a curtain that anyone could walk in anytime i mean women just sort of weren't Mm -hmm. accounted for in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. And that's really changed, which Mm -hmm. I think is huge. And I wanted to sort of demonstrate and show that progress. Um, So it wasn't perfect, the culture, but there was a ton about it that I I loved. And so despite the fact that I had other opportunities over 23 years, I stayed. I chose to stay. Well, and it it would probably speak to the culture that you were, you know, if you were in a situation that was not you know, friendly to the female, just for the art, whatever we have to go through or, yeah. or being a new mom and going through all that whole process, the the culture was flex enough. Yeah. And willing to have the conversation still at those early. It was hard in the beginning. Okay. But I, you know, like I said, I, I found as I moved up the ladder, I was able to exert some influence mm-hmm. and, uh, and make it better, you know? And because you weren't there just because you were a woman either. No, I was very capable. You were very capable. Yeah, you have, I mean, I think your um, account, I mean, I know there was many, many other things that you uh, implemented at Levi's, but I love the um, story of you marrying the brand with the music industry. Oh, thank you. And, and, but that was a great way because you were kind of revitalizing. I mean, Levi's obviously been around forever. Yeah. As far as the being a woman, just one quick uh, moment on that. I mean, there's tons of studies that show that, you know, men are promoted into their potential and women have to kind of prove that they could do a job for five years before they get promoted. Mm -hmm. And I would say that is true of my experience at Levi's. You know, I was the chief marketing officer for eight years. I had mastered it in two, you know, Mm -hmm. so I my my career while you know storied and i think i had a ton of impact it went slower than it should have Mm -hmm. and i believe that's very much because of that point that i just (laughs) just stated but it was fine i was patient and i wanted to make Mm -hmm. a difference um but you know i demonstrated a ton of impact and you know People got promoted all around me, I'll just say. Yeah. Um, and I stuck with it. And, you know, I wanted to make a difference and I loved the brand and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, so I spent eight years as a chief marketing officer, which is a super long time in that role, okay. not just given that I had already, you know, shown I could do it after two, but it's a job. Most, I think the average tenure is two years. Like most people get fired okay. in two years <laughs> okay. or see the writing on the wall and leave because it's a really hard job. Um, but when I stepped into it in 2013, so I'd already been at the company 14 years mm-hmm. or something. And my new boss, who was the CEO, he was kind of the first one that really saw what I had to offer. Right. He's also the one that shoved me out the door, but we'll get to that later. Yeah, that relationship. That relationship changed. changed. Um, But he put me in the job in 2013, and the brand was near bankruptcy. I mean, this, like, 140-year-old brand at the time 
was not doing well. He was on <laughs> life support. I don't remember the timeline specifically, but it had gone, it had been controlled by the family, like the original family and gone public and then oh, gone Oh, public. Pri- they did partial, oh. pu- yeah. The, but the, the real IPO, the initial public offering, uh, or this most recent was in 2019. Okay. And I was very much part of the team leading okay. that. But there were partial ones. It's too complicated to get into. But basically, at the time, you know, I was in the role in 2013. It was a privately held company. Okay. The Haas family um, owned the company. But I stepped in the role and the remit was clear. Get this brand back to health. Mm-hmm. You know, reinstate, reinvigorate what people love about Levi's mm-hmm. and grow the audience from there. Um, and I could see how to do it. It was like I, I knew I had already been there 14, 15 years. I knew this brand like the back of my hand. I knew how to lead a team to do it. I knew how to set a clear vision and break it down into steps and get people there. Uh, but part of the part of that reinvention was music and mm-hmm. the association with music. And we had been all over the place in terms of cultural associations. Mm-hmm. It's like we were just chasing whatever things seemed kind of cool at the time. You know, we were at Sundance and then we were at wherever, That's all right. over the place. And I said, we're going to stick to music. We didn't choose music. Music chose us. Mm -hmm. Musicians with original voices have chosen to wear Levi's since the beginning of time, Mm -hmm. from Elvis to Beyonce to Snoop Dogg to (laughs) Run DMC. Mm -hmm. I mean, I go on and on. And not just the performers, but the people in the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, and why do these performers choose Levi's? People feel like their best and most authentic selves in Levi's. They feel badass in Levi's. Mm -hmm. And so it just seemed like a natural fit. And it's funny because my team panicked. They're like, that's too narrow. Interesting. We can't not go to Sundance. I'm like, yeah, we we can not go to Sundance. We don't need to go to Sundance. Let other people go to Sundance. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I wanted an association that we could build meaning, not just slap a logo on, you know. And it's endless, the possibilities Mm -hmm. when you say we're going to focus on music. It really is. Yeah. It's endless. And um, we ended up doing all sorts of cool stuff. We had strong presence at music festivals, but we didn't just go and put a logo up. We customized product um, for the... Do, you, do they still do that? Yeah. That that was such a cool... Um... I think they do. I mean, when I look at their Instagram, <laughs> like I have no contact with anyone, but I think I saw they were at Outside Lands this, um, this last weekend. And was that customization... <laughs> Uh, like booth or, or station was that like was that your creation on me and my team yeah I was I mean I was like I want to do that yeah that sounds so well cool. and then the cool part is if you invite the stars and the celebs yeah. and then they Instagram it and you know all the cool kids who don't get to go to Coachella yeah. also see it it's yeah. that amplification obviously not to get in the marketing weeds but um, <laughs> festivals were a huge part of it all around the world yeah Everywhere, you know, Glastonbury in the UK, I'm going to forget all the names of the festivals, um, China, Beijing, all over the world. Um, so that was one aspect. But then we did this other really cool program that we called the Levi's Music Project, which was all about reinstating music education in mm-hmm. schools because schools have killed all their music yeah. education. And for some kids, it's a lifeline. Mm-hmm. And so we worked with various celebrities like Alicia Keys and Justin Timberlake to basically craft a program to bring music education back to school. So, and the list goes on and on. But but yeah. you did that with such, I know in the book, and we can talk on it or not, or, or go buy the book and read it, um, yeah. but, but the your interaction initially with Alicia Keys and that story and what I loved about it, not I mean, it was cool. And I think she inherently is cool. Like yeah. there's just something that about her presence, uh, her public presence that is amazing. But the way you approached her, and I know, like, you were a new mother, she was a new mother, and you came into that interaction with such authenticity. That's all, that's what I took away, that I was so impressed by, wow, I'm watching you come and just be completely honest, and and, and in in your own insecurities, like, I've got these, but I'm just going to do it, I'm going to step into this role, and I'm going to be honest with her, and it landed in such a powerful way. Yeah, I mean, that was a... Obviously, in hindsight, you sort of see things as like turning points in your in your career. But I that really was for me because I sat down with this person in her home, which was 
weird and overwhelming. <laughs> you know, there's Basquiat's in the bathroom, I think I said. <laughs> You're like, who lives this way? Um, but she was a new mom. You know, we had new babies about the same age, both a little tired and frazzled, um, both trying to – it was the first time I really sort of just, like, this is who I am. Yeah. You know, I'm a woman leader, female leader with lots of demands on my time. Here's why we think you're great for our brand. Mm -hmm. Here's what I love about this brand that I think you'll be able to connect to. And we just kind of connected and hit it off. And it was – you know, you spend your career trying to be this – thing that you're told you need to be yeah. and then you get to a point where you're like i'm not doing that i'm gonna just be myself and that's gonna be the right thing and it was like in that moment i think i felt that for the first time and i that was what resonated with me in that story and i think i think it does come with age and there's things that like you kind of just have to go through experiences before you have those realizations but you definitely i, I have found myself kind of kicking myself mm -hmm. in a way like it was so it's so simple. And yet I fight it to be to step into roles or step into um, experiences and be authentic. But you find that if my authentic self isn't accepted, I don't want to be there anyway. I know, but that's a tough. Lesson. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm, you know, cause, but, and, and, and it's not always feasible, right? right? Because you need the job or you need, you know whatever there's a million reasons and there's a million reasons why your authentic self actually may really be in conflict with with the place which is ultimately what i ran into i yeah. mean irony of ironies right yeah. this is a brand that uh, touts authenticity it's a culture that said come and be your authentic self mm -hmm. and when i really really did that at the end there was no place for me mm -hmm. so you're not wrong to question it you know mm -hmm. i tell people all the time like you're not wrong to be afraid to speak up and say what you think mm -hmm. it is scary but it's necessary yeah well at the end of the day at the end of my life i don't want to look back and be in conflict with who i've become yeah i i think that's that would be such that would be true regret that would be like oh i this there was another there was another entity that i just ignored and chose to to and i don't know how fulfilling is that life if you seems like not much for me but you know i think for some people it's just fine i think you know what i have learned in the last three years is most people would rather take cover in the group mm -hmm. stand with the group feel virtuous in standing with the group mm -hmm. whether or not there was any virtue involved than stand apart and stand for truth and say what is right most people do not want to stand apart from the group. The fear of being ostracized is real and intense, and most people would not choose it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not even criticizing. Well, maybe I'm criticizing a little bit. Like, that's just human nature. And I think right. if you look across history, geographies, that is just true. Yeah. Most people would prefer to stand with the group than to stand apart and do what's right. stay comfortable or a perception of comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. But and I think that's why I mean, your book and your story and um, that you have, I mean, getting ahead of the story in a bit, but that you chose to leave Levi by not taking a severance package, by saying you're not going to silence me on this one. I'm going to move into my next role and tell my story. And that that is powerful. I think coming out of the this particular COVID era where we got to see kind of the real ugly side of the woke culture. I think it's it's been building. We all loved the story about the the SNL skit. And I, I've forgotten all about that. And I love that you you chose to send them pairs yeah. of them that was made them and sent them yeah. to them. That was incredible. It's interesting. People listening or you could I show them like it it the 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 skit that we're referring to from SNL was September 2017, yeah. and it's called Levi's Wokes, and they're basically mocking brands for taking these, you know, woke positions mm -hmm. um, to try to seem cool. And it's hilarious. And when I sat down to write the book, I was like, oh, my God, I'm starting there. <laughs> it, it was the first chapter I think I wrote, yeah. even though it's in the middle. Um, but I think it's a Test if you watch it, it's so funny. I mean, I laugh out loud every time I watch it. It wouldn't they would not 
make oh, that now. Yeah. They wouldn't. You couldn't mock that because that is the it, – it's not mockable. It's the right thing. It is believed that that position, that sort of woke position that brands take, that that's untouchable. That's the it right thing to do and that is mm -hmm. um, the right way to behave. So mm -hmm. they, they would not make that fake ad now, mm -hmm. I don't believe. But it was funny. And – I remember sitting and watching it. I don't really watch Saturday Night Live very often, but I think people started texting me, like, turn on the TV. And I watched it, and I was laughing. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, my gosh, they're on to something, but that's not us. They're making fun of brands that do this, but we don't do this. Mm -hmm. Maybe we did it a little. Um, but I, I, my friends at work were all worried, like, oh, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. They're mocking us. And I said, no, we're going to just be in on the joke. Yeah. We can laugh at ourselves. If we do this a little bit, Maybe we'll stop and we'll just be in on the joke, which is how we came up with the idea to make the ridiculously silly, oversized brown gaucho <laughs> pants <laughs> and send were. them to the cast. <laughs> it was, a, I think that speaks to your mindset. Um, like before you even knew this was going to be the this challenge that was coming at you in, in 2020, or at least the start, man, it was a, it was a couple of years. You're yeah. still on that journey. Yeah, I yeah. am. <laughs> But we, I was talking about it before, and it was like when we saw that, I remember that skit. And, and I think we were able to poke fun at it and able to laugh along with it because that, the woke mob that it's become was still on the fringes. And it was kind of this extreme like, yeah. well, there's, you know, there's left and there's right, and then there's like the extremes on both yeah. sides. But those are the, the fringes. Yeah. And, so we can like poke fun. Yeah. And we'll laugh at them. Now and it's both taken sides. over. Yeah. And it's and I, I will I having uh, other like, you know, lifelong liberal friends. Yeah. And a lot of them are like, this is not this is not normal. This is not what we signed up for. Like, you know, we kind of maybe I've had some friends like be like, well, we, maybe we should have said something. But you had no idea it was going to turn into this. Well, it happened slowly and then all at once. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, and then all of a sudden you're blindsided and mm -hmm. you're like. This is crazy. Yeah. This is not normal. There is, I can see a thing. Well, here's what happened is ideology and the narrative of the woke left trumps truth. Mm -hmm. Truth doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. You can, and if you point out that some of this is founded on things that are patently false and untrue, mm -hmm. then you're a heretic because you violated the narrative and the ideology. And that was very true with COVID. Mm -hmm. Um Somehow, in deep blue states and cities, mm -hmm. the the narrative put forth by Democrats, my former party, the mm -hmm. left, and it merged with the woke position, was you have to stay home forever. You have to lock your children inside. They won't be harmed by that. Mm -hmm. Children need to protect adults. And if you complain about any of this, you're a horrible person mm -hmm. and you just want old people and teachers to die. Mm -hmm. That was the narrative. It was built upon a foundation of lies. I mean, I could cite the lies all day long. First lie is everyone's at equal risk. False. Mm -hmm. That was never the case. Right. Second lie is that lockdowns were actually going to help. <laughs> lie mm -hmm. that didn't that closed schools were going to help the children won't be harmed by closed schools mm -hmm. um that wanting schools open was racist mm -hmm. i mean i could just go on and on um and if you pointed out that this whole practice was fundamentally based on lies you were you banished with force but it's not just the COVID narrative i mean the body positive movement mm -hmm. OK, this started in a place that I think is was good. Mm -hmm. You know, I was anorexic as a teenage gymnast. The idea that my value is associated with what I look like and what I weigh, that's terrible. Mm -hmm. All humans have value <laughs> no matter right, what absolutely. they look like. So it came from this good place of being more inclusive. And I think even through our advertising efforts, for instance, at Levi's, I think showing women who aren't all 6'2 and 98 pounds mm -hmm. is a good thing, right? We can all kind of relate more and see ourselves in the product. Mm -hmm. But it's gone to this insane place, yeah. which is healthy at any size. No, right. that's not true. And it's a disservice to people. Mm -hmm. And it's dangerous. It's a lie. Mm -hmm. 
value at any size as a human. You are not less than or more than because of how you look. Yeah. But it is fundamentally factually incorrect. Right. And it's like you say, said it's dangerous. It's a and da- it's dangerous. So when you, when if you critique us saying that someone who you know is, I mean, I'll, it's a medical term, morbidly obese. Yes. If we're gonna put this person and say this this is healthy. That's a problem. We, that's you, that, based on a lie. Yeah, we. This person is looking at different, different medical issues. That this is this is not the ideal for your physicality. No. So it doesn't mean you're less of a person. No. And that's not what we're saying when we criticize this no. movement. But it's been such a. But it's you see there was a seed of the movement that was positive. Right. We're going to be more inclusive. We're not going to sort of have this one ideal mm-hmm. that makes many women feel ugly and not included and drives them sometimes to dangerous places in terms of body image and self-worth. That's good. Mm -hmm. And then it just went, it went to this completely crazy place, Mm -hmm. which is you are healthy at any size. There's this new concept called food neutrality. Have you heard of this? No, no, All foods are equal. It's just as good to eat a donut (laughs) as it is to eat an apple. I mean, no, it's not. Are we, why, why are we, I don't have an answer for this. So, but why is that happening? Like what, what are we trying? Are we just trying to be so comfortable in, in thought and in action that we are choosing just to like nerf everything? I ask myself this every day. (laughs) I think there's, I'm not totally sure because you have various sort of pillars of this platform, right? Like there's the the COVID narrative and that ideology. There's this body positivity. There's gender ideology, Mm -hmm. which I think is fundamentally based on factual inaccuracy Mm -hmm. and untruth that there are not, in fact, two, uh, you know, differences between the biological sexes. There just are. Um, I don't know. I think it's a confluence of things. Yeah, you know, I think there's the, the sort of safetyism movement mm-hmm. and this idea that we all need to feel safe in who we are all the time and who we are is okay. Yeah. Mm, it's, we can be better. There, mm-hmm. There's things that we right. should work to correct about ourselves. So, you know, that's part of it. And it's gone so far as to sort of normalize every abnormal thing. Right. Um, I think there is a really, there's an emergent or having emerged culture of, you know, a victim culture right. where you sort of um, are given kind of higher ranking or status in the yeah. pecking order if you have more sort of claims to being right. a, a victim. I've been persecuted, so I, I need to get... Yeah, I think that kind of kind of contributes. Um, Again, though, so many of these things were started like with good intention. Yeah. Like it was, it was something that we needed to raise awareness to and we needed a solution. Yeah. But instead of going to the heart of the problem and wanting to figure out how to make everyone kind of more equal as we're moving through this, like let's level the playing field. Like that's, that's something that we can, we can fix that instead of going after like the source of the problem, we like fixed the, like the final product and just thought, well, we'll just, we'll push these people ahead or we'll move things around in giving, giving credit where it's not really valid. Like that's not quite well, it's how- all, And it's also retrograde, right? In, in many ways, I think, um, what's being sort of billed as progress kind of flattens us into these groups. Mm. Um, if we, if we take sort of the, the gender ideology, for instance, we get, it's here's what I mean by it's retrograde. <laughs> a, a a little boy who perhaps has more feminine qualities, now he's automatically hmm. assumed or considered or possibly considered to be a girl. Why? We have worked feminists like myself for many, many years to say you can be a woman and have all kinds of different skills mm-hmm. and capabilities and ways of presenting. Mm-hmm. You know, I was a tomboy. So I was a very athletic child. I was a tomboy. That doesn't make me a boy. That makes me an athletic girl. And so it, there's this weird sort of retrograde mm. aspect to it, um, feigning progress. Mm-hmm. It's all 
we're not really seen as individuals anymore. Yeah. You're sort of flattened into these groups and certain characteristics are assumed to mean certain things yeah. about you. Um, so, which is, you know, to bring it back to the COVID story, because it became hyper politicized from the beginning, mm -hmm. because I challenged the narrative of the left, which for whatever reason, the narrative of the left was everybody has to stay home forever and ever and mm -hmm. ever. It was automatically assumed that I was like an alt right. Yeah, because we're all just you're it's black and white, one yeah. group or the you other. If you're not this, into you're that. that. Yeah. Instead got, of being like you what? get flattened into yeah. that group. The arc of your life doesn't matter. The things that you've marched for and fought for and you know, I mean, I worked at the National Organization for Women mm -hmm. when I was 19 and I was in college. I have marched for every left wing thing, not everyone, but, you know, the ones that have mattered to me under the sun. None of that, none of that, none yeah. of that makes a difference. My favorite criticism is you are always alt right in disguise. Mm. I just waited till I was 50 years old to spring <laughs> it on you. I mean, what would the point of that even be? It's just so dumb. Right. And we and we need all the different versions of all the things. Like I think but all, you can't. There's no room for uh, it anymore. I, I mean, I yes. think people have to push back against it. But you know, it used to be there were there were spots on the spectrum. Yeah. Like there was yeah, you could. There were there aren't anymore. No, you have to be all the things. At least on the left, I, I have not been a. I, I'm an independent, so I'm not. I, I don't want to adhere or be forced to adhere to any ideological platform. So I'm just going to stay independent. <laughs> um, but I can say on the left, if you do not check every box that is the furthest left mm -hmm. that you can be, you are not welcome in that party anymore. Well, I think there's been there's been uh, moments of that for both sides. I think right now yes. we're highlighting definitely the 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 left is kind of the going through their yeah. their moment. But I don't think that the right is untouchable. No, I that. agree. And I grew up on the on the right. And, and so I have things that now I'm kind of unpacking as I get mm -hmm. older from a different perspective, because as well, I like for I think when I moved out of the house, I was like, I'm an independent. Like, I'm not I I don't I didn't I was kind of just apolitical. Mm -hmm. Like, I just don't like any of it. I don't yeah. like the arguing. I hate pol like whenever when any election happens, it's just like I know we all hate it now. But even then, I was just found the whole thing just like everyone's just Tiresome. yelling at the other side yeah. and just what and then i had a just automatic distrust for anybody in politics that was that's, probably spot on <laughs> <laughs> it just yeah we've definitely gotten to see behind the curtain on that one in a lot of ways and i'm kind of getting ahead of myself but i i do think it's it's interesting to watch and again back to your book and you d detailing your uh, journey through all of that. I just I I was so grateful to hear like this. These are the voices we need to be hearing. These people exist. People who are on the left. Because I think people. Because <laughs> if we, if we're on the right and go well, if you're just on the other side of this line, yeah, we're still not going to listen because you look like those things that are are screaming the loudest. And it's like no no no. There is a huge group of people. I I yeah I I couldn't agree with you more. I um. And I think we misunderstand each other mm -hmm. and assume certain things about each other at our own peril. Mm -hmm. And if you don't sit and listen to understand mm -hmm. where the other person is coming from. Um, look, I, I've i been pro-choice my whole life. That opinion has sort of – I still am, but it's moderated a bit given current – science and, you know, mm -hmm. availability of birth control, these kinds of things. I won't get into the details, but I have a lot of friends who are pro-life and I 100 percent understand why mm -hmm. I do. Mm -hmm. I make a different choice about the issue, mm -hmm. but I get it and it doesn't serve us to not understand it and mm -hmm. not sort of give validity to the perspective. How does that serve us mm -hmm. in trying to build a bridge and understand and come up with policy that serves the most people, mm -hmm. the most women? And so I think we hate each other and misunderstand each other and demonize each other and make assumptions about how the other side thinks yeah. at our peril. Well, and I wonder, too, if like because I years ago um, there was a book and I'm going to blank on the name, um, but it was it kept focused on uh, like tribalism it, mm -hmm. or it, it kind of unpacked tribalism mm -hmm. and, and what we're seeing now and how that relates to if we go back, you know, to our yeah. to our origin stories yeah. and, and maybe what we look like in more nomadic cultures. Yeah. 
And uh, you, it was like, oh my gosh, that that's the word for it. That's what we're doing. And I think yeah, that was several right. years ago yeah. that that was kind of coming on the scene where we were realizing we're starting to, we're not just on the other side, we're pulling away from each other and becoming our own entities. Like yeah. we function us away from you. Yeah. Um, we don't care what you think. We're going to make yeah. our own rules and yeah. we're going to abide by them. And it's like, well, then the other side's doing the same thing. And well, this is America. Like how do we create policy for everybody if this is what we're doing i i mean the reason i remain hopeful and i know there's a lot of people that talk about like let's just separate <laughs> you know <laughs> red and blue <laughs> will separate um which i don't think is a rational realistic i don't think people realize what that actually I, would it's look not, like it's not a realistic action right. right um i remain hopeful because I think that you are right. I think that most people reside in the territory of common sense. Mm. I think most people, meaning 60 to 70 percent of people, aren't that far mm. away. And the distance that we have from each other, we can understand mm. if we just would sit down and, and talk. talk to each other. Yeah. And we'd be able to go, you know what? I still don't agree with you, but I get where you're coming from and... Mm. I have empathy for the position and we can coexist and it's fine. empathy. I think that's been something that I'm like, that's what we're missing. We just, we've, we've lost this ability to empathize with anybody else with a different story than ours. We are letting the 10% or less than 10% on either side dominate the conversation and terrorize the rest of us with common sense. Yeah. And I just won't do it. I'm not going to let them do it. But I'm not going to. And that, that, and writing the book and tell, continuing to tell your story and choosing not to take the financial benefit of, you know, leaving. While I will say, after your amount of time at that company, it was like, really, that's all she's going to get to walk <laughs> that's away? That's funny. <laughs> that's funny because there were there are people who are like, there's no way they would have given her that. I'm like, do you know what? They just paid my replacement. <laughs> like that was nothing. It's a fraction. Most people, it's a very re realistic offer, yeah. if not low for someone that is at my level. just felt yeah. like <laughs> after, well, and because you had a, like, well, you'd have to read the book to understand your real, all the depths of your relationship with Chip. Uh, but I thought like you, you painted that. You did a great job of that one as well, because I think that was it was very human. Like you you showed the positive and how yeah. great. And, you know, he was um, instrumental in like in your career as you move Accelerated forward. Accelerated my career. Absolutely. And what a great, um, I don't know, partnership or just a, an ally that you had for a yeah. long time. And yet, you know, at the end, it, yeah. it definitely unraveled and he ended up not supporting me, not supporting you. And I mean, I, you know, I can't see inside his mind. I'm, no one can. I don't really know what's going on. But I felt like he was it was a coward move um, yeah. in a lot of ways. I agree. And that is just cowardice for me personally is one something that I really don't want to have in my life. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I I see it sometimes, yeah. and I you know I fall prey to it, and I'm like, oh, and I'm so disappointed with how that goes. But I do think that like as long as you're aware and you're moving forward, like yeah. that's progress. Look, we're all afraid sometimes, and totally. and exhibiting courage doesn't mean you're not afraid. Uh, but the lack of moral courage mm. and courageous leadership that he exhibited, I'll just say it, is incredibly disappointing yeah. to me because. I hadn't seen that in him. You know, I thought more of him than mm -hmm. that. And I think I was wrong. Yeah. I think that was who he is. I don't think that that behavior was the exception. Yeah. I think that was, I think that was the It was disappointing. Rule. But you walked, you seemed to walk away. And I know it, you, you, you had other things that you were going to move into as far as, you know, plans beyond once you realized that. You're going to be leaving Levi's and that's, yeah. okay, um, what's my plan B at this point? Yeah. I make a documentary film now about the impact of the prolonged school closures okay. to kids. So and that's I, something you're working on currently. I'm working on it okay. now. And this is a generational catastrophe. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean every child. And, you know, yes, I know some lady out there is saying, my kids are fine. I was home and I helped my kids. Fine. Too large of a number. I don't know what the percentages are not fine. Mm -hmm. um, 
chronic absenteeism is at an all-time high. We're seeing dropout rates skyrocket. I mean, if just a fraction of this generation more does not graduate from high school, does not have basic reading and math skills, right. that's a catastrophe. Yeah. Uh, that is, you know, then on top of that, you have the mental health impacts. Um I mean, the older children, it's like the ones that fell behind in the two years that just never re-engaged, mm -hmm. they're just not finishing school. Yeah. Never mind the younger children, because we know factually that if a child isn't reading by third grade, mm -hmm. the likelihood of graduating from high school on time is, mm -hmm. I think, diminished by four acts or something wow. like that. And wow. so if a child started kindergarten and Zoom school... They're not reading They're by third reading. grade. So I I think we have yet to see, you know, the generational harms play out. But it's why it would enrage me mm -hmm. <laughs> when people would say, well, it's just two weeks or it's just two months or it's just two years. Mm -hmm. It's not. Mm -hmm. It is not yeah. just anything. And yes, maybe for your child who had a tutor at home or a pod or went back to school or just had your support. but. Right. Ha I was just astonished by the lack of empathy and imagination to be able to imagine that child that was not like mine. Mm -hmm. My children did have every advantage and privilege possible. Strong Wi-Fi. They had, you know, parents at home. And still the isolation mm -hmm. was horrible. Well, for those, we know, I mean, for childhood development, those younger, those um uh those developmental years where they're tr learning how to be social and learning how to interact. And that's the whole point of school. Right. Is, and uh, I mean, not to go all the way, but like, I remember like the masks and a couple of, um, experts in the field and like, you know, childhood Ugh. development were saying like children learn, you know, by watching facial expressions yeah. and, and speech development and all those things that they're fine tuning as they get yeah. older by doing this, like, yeah. that's also causing a problem. Oh, language development, yeah. so, you know, emotional development, learning to connect with people and read facial expressions. Right. And the American Academy of Pediatrics suddenly said it's not necessary to see facial expressions. I mean, they completely politi that organization yeah. became completely politicized. It used to say on their website, you know, moms, you got to get close to your baby and you got to talk to them and they need to see your face and learn from your facial expression. Suddenly all of that disappeared. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, there's no evidence that masking, prolonged masking implement, uh, impacts language development, emotional development. There's no evidence because it's never been studied. Right. It's right. obvious right. that it will. And we're seeing that now. The right. language delays are significant. Um, but again, common sense. Yeah. But it was made ideological. There was a narrative, which is you have to wear 37 masks. <laughs> you, um, The only thing that matters mm -hmm. is preventing COVID. Yeah. I mean, and then, that was really, that was the premise of all of it. That is the only thing that matters. All other harms be damned. Right. And it's just not, we can't live our lives and construct our society around the prevention of a respiratory virus mm. um, that essentially is only dangerous for the very old and infirm. Right, right. Yeah, and, I, and it was always so funny that like you became an immediate COVID denier. And even to this day, <laughs> like that, like you just were denying that it was a thing. And it was like, no, I, I shouldn't have to qu like qualify this, but no, I'm aware that it's a thing. And I'm aware that like there are things we can change about what we're doing or yeah. get better educated on stuff. But yeah, like to your point, like there there were very specific groups that were very much at risk. Yeah. And we old, saw that. Very old people. Yeah. And I, you know, I have grandparents that are, you know, of that age. And like, I totally understand. We're taking yeah. precautions that make sense. Yeah. I but, think in San Francisco to this day, more people over 90 have died of COVID or with COVID than under 70. Yeah. More people over 90. It was, I mean, and, and which that, is above the average life expectancy, by the way, I over know, 90. I know. And, the, and when you say, I mean, what math is racism now or whatever, yeah, but it like is. it's like these are just numbers. These are, they, you know, I, I know I'm not taking. I have to speak numbers. Of course, I have to take the humanity out of it. Yeah. But I'm not unaware that these are humans and of people's course. family. Like of we are not un 
caring to yeah. the to the death of a loved one. Like, no. uh, of course not. Like, but also like but we became. But very old people with multiple comorbidities have been at risk of cold, flu. I, yeah, you know the flu has. I mean, just since the, forever. It's right. it's the sort of premise that this prevention of a single disease, the myopic like emphasis on the prevention of a single disease informed every aspect of our society, all other harms be damned mm -hmm. for two years. And in some ways still is. is People yeah. will say the restrictions ended, but I'm sorry, you know, Novak Djokovic can't play <laughs> in a right. tournament in this country. It doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, you know, Marin County Elementary Schools in Northern California just re-implemented a mask mandate despite mm. all evidence to the contrary. So it's still very much informing m much of the way that we operate. And I, it's madness. I don't know, like as we move forward, but because of this new social media element where so much of our personal lives yeah. are now public yeah. and like, what are your, like, should companies just not be political? Um, my opinion, I guess, yeah. is that so many companies have gotten political by yeah. who they stand behind political yeah. parties, um, what, you know, what the executives donate to as far yeah. as who that whatever. And I get it. That then puts you in a weird spot as yeah. a company where now you're worried what the employees say. What do we do moving forward? Because well, we're going to have differing opinions. I mean, I think individuals have to. I have no issue with individuals in a company giving to whatever party they want. Right. That's a version of speech like you shouldn't not be able to do that. Mm -hmm. It's different than the company doing right. it. And and in so, some sort of fairness, you know, Levi's calls themselves apolitical. So they don't give to candidates. They don't endorse candidates. Okay. But let's be clear. <laughs> we know where their politics are. And every cause, every side of every cause that they take is is very left-leaning. Mm -hmm. um, and they do take sides and, and those things. And some of those I – supported and mm -hmm. kind of furthered. And I, I feel like, you know, it happened slowly and then all at once. You know, I was very much in favor of a more inclusive um, body positive mm -hmm. stance in terms of and then all of a sudden it got to this place. I was like, wait, 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 that's too far. Like the it, it all got kind of away from right. from me. Um, and I, I think one thing I didn't realize and I use the body positive one because it's a little less politicized, but not really. It's still very ideological. What I didn't realize, because Levi's, for instance, has taken a stance around um, gun safety, mm -hmm. gun violence prevention, which is interpreted by the right as anti-Second Amendment. I'm not going to debate whether that is the case um, or not. But what I didn't totally understand, because I worked in corporate in San Francisco and everybody in San Francisco is – either very, very left-leaning or very left-leaning. Like that's the, that's the, that's the range. So you don't even know people that aren't like you, but there are offices in Texas. There are distribution centers in, you know, Kentucky and Las Vegas, mm -hmm. and there are stores in every state across the country. Mm -hmm. I did not realize the extent to which the stances that we were taking made a lot of employees feel very much not part of the culture mm. and feel very much like they couldn't be themselves and say what they actually thought. And I think that's really unfortunate, mm -hmm. you know, in an attempt to create an inclusive culture where you do, you know, sometimes exactly the opposite. Yeah. I, I think people are – an individual should never have to give up their rights as a citizen to work in a company. I mean, a lot of people have said to me, well, you are the face of the company. Um, there's different rules for you. Mm. You shouldn't be able to say these things. Okay. Um, one, I had no contract that said that. So that may be true theoretically, but then make me sign a piece of paper, which right. I'm probably going to choose not to right. sign. That's the first thing. But I would argue the opposite. If a well-liked leader in a company can't fight for the things that she believes in, mm -hmm. do you really think a mid-level employee is going right. to be able to? Right. I mean, come on. Right. A high-performing, well-liked, long-tenured employee mm -hmm. can't 
fully avail herself of her, uh, herself of what it means to be an American citizen. You think anybody else yeah, can? Talk about affecting the culture. So, it, you know, I, I reject that. So I think we all have to kind of get back to a place where we believe in free speech and open debate and yeah. dissent. And I think what's really frightening to me is a lot of people are really willing to give up those things yeah. for a feeling of safety and yeah. belonging. Not on my watch. So I'm going to do everything I can to fight for that. A separate issue is how should companies behave? And, you know, I spend quite a bit of time in, in the book talking about the lie that is woke capitalism yes. and how these stances are hypocritical. You know, they're an attempt to curry favor with younger consumers and align with their values. Um, it's it's a pro it's a marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. It's a money making strategy. You're being duped if you believe that these companies care about these causes. Mm -hmm. And if you believe that they treat these groups they claim to care about with any right. <laughs> regard at all. Um, it's also a shield from scrutiny and the press buys it. They love it. They love companies that take these woke stances and they don't interrogate and they don't investigate. And that's how you get things like FTX and Sam Bankman Freed. Mm -hmm. He's celebrated or was for several years mm -hmm. as a hero, a woke hero. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, he's defrauding investors and stealing money from everyday folks right. because nobody bothered to look at the p and I mean, it was all right. obvious. On I'm the sure. backs of moral superiority. Right. So they just buy the whole story. Yeah. So it's dangerous. It's also a huge distraction for businesses. And it started to really creep in and then take over. And I felt like, when are we going to get back to basics? Like if we all we do is talk about all this other stuff, mm -hmm. which alienates half the country, by the way, when do we talk about the genes? Right. So I think ultimately, out of necessity, companies are going to get back to basics. They're going to need to get back to the basics, yeah. marketing, product excellence, marketing it aspirationally for as many people as possible and treating employees fairly. Mm -hmm. But right now, C-suiters and CEOs are operating out of fear of this tiny yeah. woke mob minority, and they're not there yet. It's going to take a while, and I think it's going to take some businesses really um, starting to crack mm -hmm. and and crumble and mm -hmm. they're going to see that it's not effective and it's not working. Yeah. And I think, I mean, as a society, we, you know, those of us that are not in those positions, at the, like the executives, and I do think that they have the responsibility to, this is your time, you need to step into these roles or we are like, we I will not be able to move forward. Mm -hmm. And the fallout of that is not going to be good for us as a country. Like, I know we all kind of played the like, what if game yeah. with different different ways of like, how does this all pan out? And yeah. if this happens, and I mean, it, I they're, they're cowards. I, I'm mm. so I, I mean, I, I said this sort of a little more hesitantly in the beginning of my <laughs> kind of um, process and in, in, in talking about the book, but now I'll say it on a, yeah, without hesitation. The vast majority of them are cowards mm -hmm. and they want to be seen as social justice warriors because they love being celebrated and they're not celebrated for being rich. They're denigrated. You're supposed to renounce all your privilege. It's mostly white men. They feel like, you know, the evildoers of the world today. But if they, you know, fight for social justice enough, they can still be celebrated in a way that their egos it's demand. It's their penance to get out but of But all they want, it's their penance, but all yeah. they really want, they're in it for the money. Let me be clear. They are not social justice warriors. <laughs> they are greedy executives. That's what they are. And that bottom line is all they're worried about. That's what they are. Yeah. And so do, you know, do not, <laughs> do not be fooled, but they, they don't want to risk that money for themselves. And if they can pose in such a way that has people believe in their goodness and their social warrior status to protect their own wealth, that's what they're doing. Yeah. Um, it's so naive to perceive them as different than that. And I don't think, I, I don't, I mean, as a, a, a business, a corporate executive, that is your job to, you know, I'm not, to build. I mean, I'm not maligning it, but I will just a little bit. Let me just, <laughs> you know, I agree. Your fiduciary responsibility is to deliver profits for the company. Right. Let's not mince words on that. Like that's, that's your job. If you, if me as the chief marketing officer, if I'm not bringing in new customers and driving revenue, profitable revenue for the company, I should be fired. That's, that's my job. Let's not, you know, mince words about that. But I do think 
there is a trend Mm -hmm. in the last 20, 30 years of outsized corporate greed. So, you know, CEOs make over 350 times that of the average employee. In the late 60s, they only made 20 times that of the average. So they've actually gotten greedier Mm -hmm. while pretending to be more about justice, Mm. which I think just proves how much of a charade it is. Mm -hmm. Um, There's something wrong there. Mm -hmm. I mean, a a story I tell in the book is under the cover of COVID, Levi's CEO laid off 15% of the workforce because our business was not good, Mm -hmm. right? Our stores were closed. I mean, I think in March, April, May of 2020, our business was down like 70%. These are numbers you don't ever expect to see as a leader. So it was a tough time. Laid off 15% of the workforce. We said we did it with empathy, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. It bolstered the stock price and the CEO cashed out on $43 million in stock. Mm -hmm. That was incredibly eye-opening. How much empathy? The empathetic position would have been, and not a single company as far as I know did this, Mm -hmm. fight to get stores open, Mm -hmm. life open, so Mm -hmm. people could work and have the dignity of work. And Um, but nobody did that. Yeah. I mean, I think some of the farms did. That's it. That's it. Yeah. That's it. That was a great, and um, just a story or just to, to kind of open everyone's eyes to like, remember all of those announcements coming from all of the corporations and all the like, and yet, I mean, I can't say it happened that same way everywhere, but yeah. Oh, it did. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it did. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. But just that, and then it was painted that like we're doing like this caring we're all in thing this for together. Yeah. No, we're not. No, we're not. You got forty three million, and that guy with no savings just lost her job. Living paycheck to paycheck, lost his job. Yeah. And it was at a time where like you couldn't go out and get a different one because nothing was open. No. Like no one was going to work. And you know, in the company they justify, well, that 43 million, that's a different bucket of money. Oh, stop. It's money. And I I'm not gonna do the math now off the top of my head. It would have kept a lot of people employed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a <laughs> it's just a wild time. But the 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 self-justification, because yeah. I can tell you what the conversations in the boardrooms are. It's, well, we need to pay these sort of outsized corporate C-suite salaries because we won't get the best talent if mm-hmm. we don't. Like, this is just the way it is. Well, one, you're not getting the best talent by paying that. There's tons of people all over the place who are failing up, who just do a crap job at one mm-hmm. company and get hired at the next one for even more money. Um But why? See, this is where I say exhibit some real moral courage and some real leadership and say, you know what, we're going to right size that differential Mm -hmm. between CEO compensation and average. Uh, You know, this may be viewed as sort of an anti-capitalist view, but I'll just be fine with that. Some of my old lefty. You are welcome to have your opinion. (laughs) One of my old lefty. (laughs) But if you're a CEO, let's just say it came down 350 times to 100 times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're still really rich. If you make 100 times the average employee in a year, that's still... Mm -hmm. a lot Mm -hmm. of money. Um, I imagine you could attract great talent for that, but you could pay a more living wage Mm -hmm. for the, you know, employees in stores, for instance, employees in distribution centers. Like, and this is where I feel like this should be the mission of, of companies across the country. And it used to be, I mean, Henry Ford used to say, I wanna make a car that every one of my employees can afford to Mm -hmm. buy and drive. So here's what, if I were ever to lead (laughs) a company again, I would focus on product excellence, honest aspirational marketing and treating employees with dignity and respect Mm -hmm. and, and paying them fairly well. And if that means the top has to come down a little bit to bring the bottom up, Mm. you can change the lives of the employees in your company by doing that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this idea, well, capitalism, which claims to change the world, that's the lie. Mm -hmm. But can you make a difference of the lives of your employees Mm -hmm. one company at a time? Absolutely. Like, to me, that's meaningful work. Yeah. Well, and all that, all these, all these 
um, statements of compassion. Like, let's yeah, actually put do our it. Let, yeah. But it's like a it seems like a smaller dream <clears throat> to say, you know, I'm going to improve the lives of the people that work here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to improve the lives, maybe in a small way, by making a great product that makes your life a little better mm -hmm. rather than you know, changing the entire world, which is a lot of what, you know, these woke CEOs are claiming to be able to do. That's, that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the minute they start talking about saving the world, I would say, focus on your community mm -hmm. of employees. I mean, the number of emails I get from CEOs who say, thank you for taking a stand. I support you. I can't do so publicly because they're afraid of mm -hmm. the woke employees. Um, but I, I support you over here quietly. Mm -hmm. I can't even tell anyone I read your book because that would, you know, pigeonhole me as X, Y, or Z. But I'm like, why can't you? That's You're the CEO. <laughs> you actually are the leader. You could transform that yeah. culture. The the power to of change is like at their fingertips. And they won't do and it. And they won't do it. It's really, yeah. it's kind of pathetic. Well, and... <laughs> I mean, I, I have like hope and then simultaneously, like with that type of a realization that people are, you know, I mean, it's great that they're choosing to encourage you privately. But like the other side of that is this this horrible reality of like, you are the change like you. Yeah. It's right <laughs> there. Like you've made all these and then you can't and you won't do it. And so then I have a real yeah. pessimistic I outlook know. for like are we owed this? If this is, these are our leaders and these are the choices they're making. And I get, we're not a collect, we don't, you know, we're not just this one mass group of people, yeah. but it's just disheartening to be it like, is. so you guys have all of this control, all of this influence and you won't do it. And you won't do it. Yeah. You won't even have the conversation publicly. You won't even say it was an inter. you know, it, I read this book, don't agree with it all, but right. I, I found it interesting. Yeah. Like the power that that would just influence people to pick up the book. I know. And start the conversation. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, the, the catalyst, I think the reason like podcasts are becoming so interesting and even a lot of the, the people, individuals in the media who have come out of the conservative side who are now a little bit more just like, let's just have a platform to talk. Yeah. Like, I don't care. Like, I have my own personal beliefs, but like, let's just have yeah. conversations. Um, I guess that's where I take some hope in it that yeah. it's slow. It's not as fast as I want it to be. It is slow. But I think... It will happen. Mm. It's very hard and it's very slow. I think it'll happen for a few reasons. I I believe in my heart of hearts that truth always rears its head in the end. It just does. Mm -hmm. And the mental gymnastics you have to do to believe some of the lies that are being furthered. Mm. It's like I can't even keep the lies straight to try to understand the other side. It's confusing. You know, like how do you get to a place where the – anti-racist thing to do is to close the public schools where where the majority of the black children are in attendance yeah. like it does it I, honestly like the flip-flopping and gymnastics you have mm -hmm. to do to get there is too insane people yeah. can't <laughs> retain it so i think truth ultimately prevails mm -hmm. um i think from a business perspective we're just going to enter into a difficult cycle where mm -hmm. business are going to have no other choice but to get back to basics. Mm -hmm. They're just going to yeah. have to because this other stuff is a waste of time. It's not working. They think it's working because they everyone they know agrees with them. Mm -hmm. But it, it it's just going to start to infringe on business performance. And we're, we're starting to see some of that, or at least I evidence mean, of that. Yeah. I mean, I think Disney is a, a really good example. Mm -hmm. um, you have a business that was hit hard by COVID, mm -hmm. right? All the parks were closed. Um, that that business, their parks business has not really emerged yet. Mm -hmm. They have a streaming business, which is losing money, but very popular. How do you fix that? Mm -hmm. And yet you had a CEO who seemed to spend most of his time arguing with Ron DeSantis. Mm -hmm about this quote unquote don't say gay bill right, right. Uh, because employees were demanding right. that he do it i don't even think he wanted to mm -hmm. you know i think so he if initially didn't you mm -hmm. know he knew that the business was in a tough spot and they need to focus there he should have stuck with that right. um but you know the headlines of the last year and a half before he was pushed out of the company were all him sort of waging war with a very popular governor right. instead of focusing on what 
he was going to fix in the business. So I think it's a cautionary tale. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And I think a lot of businesses out of sheer necessity are going to just get back to basics. Mm -hmm. I mean, some companies in California, San Francisco, employees are refusing to go to the office still. Mm -hmm. They're still not working in the office. And if anyone believes that that does not impact productivity, they're insane. (laughs) Right. Um. So I, I just I think it's going it, to it, out of necessity, out of a need to kind of get businesses back on track and kind of cohere the cultures. There's just going to have to be a back to basics. Yeah. And I think a lot of employees are really tired of it. You know, that 60 to 70 percent who want common sense, they're af- they're tired of being afraid to say what they think at work. They're tired of walking on eggshells. They're tired of spending 20% of their time in sensitivity training rather than on the work at hand. Mm-hmm. And so I think slowly but surely people are going to screw up their courage and start to say something. I hope so. I really, I mean, and I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I think that I think that's at least I'm going to hold on to that as like we've got there's going to be a turn. And I think, you know, if you do look at everything, we are seeing a, a, a change happen. There is I don't know if it's the momentum I want, but it does feel like we're fi- Stories are finally coming out. And yeah, it's still very much. I do. I agree with you. I mean, for instance, there's stories all the time now about the learning loss that happened mm-hmm. during COVID. That is generally accepted to be true. That's, you know, in the heat of COVID, if you talked about learning yeah, loss, they said that was a racist concept. Right. There's no such thing as learning loss. Now, yeah. people are like, OK, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that shit's real. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, yeah, exactly. Now, they don't go so far as to hold anyone accountable right. for having made decisions that drove the learning loss. And that concerns me because it's like, it, you know, we can write the ship as much as, as best we can and get back to basics and and start to focus on, all right, we're going to get, we're no longer dealing with that. We're just going to do, you know, get back to work. But the next thing that comes up, if we don't address oh, the, yeah. um, the way misinformation was spread and the, the, in, the just complete rejection of any conversation of yeah like you uh, let's bring on an opposing view yeah like just so i can hear the other side yeah um that was just non-existent and so and we are seeing i think with like the the way media is changing and not not the big names unfortunately but they may have seen their day and maybe they're done i'm not sure if we're moving into a new era of media but it's exciting to see even your like circuit of who who you've been speaking with publicly on air and um, is been these are great conversations. Yeah, I think the thing that's disheartening, you know, about my circuit, <laughs> if I if I may say so, is, um, you know, I've been embraced in sort of the more right wing mm. media circles, the more conservative media circles, and I'm happy to talk to anyone. I there is no one that I mm-hmm. won't talk to. I don't care if we disagree on some things and agree on others. I want to have the debate. Um, And I found there's a ton we do agree on. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what's unfortunate is what's considered mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Still, you know, uh, CNN, New York Times, um, although New York Times did cover my story when I first quit in a, in a, I think, fair and balanced Mm -hmm. manner. Um, But they will not... In, and I'm not asking to be included, include me or a person like me, mm-hmm. a parent, a common sense parent who pushed for open schools and to end restrictions on children because we saw the board. Mm-hmm. We saw what was going to happen and we were right. They still won't include a person like me. They still won't because here's why. A person like me would highlight their accountability. Mm-hmm. They never included a voice that represented that perspective. The only voices you could hear in places like that were the most hysterical voices. You had, you know, teachers unions, people from big pharma (laughs) and um, and public health leaders saying we cannot open the schools. All the children and teachers will die. And everybody who wants to open the schools is a terrible, very bad person. That was the narrative. If they were to invite someone in who saw it and understood it before, whether it's me or a doctor or somebody else, a parent, Mm -hmm. they would be highlighting their own complicity. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to do that. They won't do that. They're never going to do that. But I think that's, I mean, I 
I want that to be I want that to be their demise. Like the fact that like any any media, anybody that is, jo you know, perceived job is to tell a story, tell the stories like you have to tell all the stories. There was no journalism happening. No, you know, we've gotten they so far was away from that. the only thing that happened. You know, the pages of The New York Times printed government press releases mm -hmm. And Pfizer press releases as if they were news. Here is another example. You know, the recent uh, study, the Cochrane study on the ineffectiveness of masks. Mm. I don't know if you – anyway, there was this big meta-analysis, like over 70 studies, which basically all show that masks did right. nothing to, to slow the spread of COVID. It's a little controversial, but it's pretty definitive. And Cochrane has always been considered the, the gold standard, although now the no, masky good. people are saying Cochrane's terrible. Um, there was a piece in the New York Times about the study by Brett Stevens, who's an opinion writer, a conservative opinion writer. It was a pretty forceful piece, mm -hmm. basically reiterating right. with force that masks have done work. nothing. Right. Why isn't the science page writing about it? Why isn't the science desk writing about it? Mm -hmm. We had to read it on an opinion page mm -hmm. from the conservative columnists who the New York Times readers will just dismiss. Right. But the science desk is not going to write about it because it contradicts everything they've said mm -hmm. hysterically for three years. Mm -hmm. So they cannot write about it without implicating themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem. Yeah. But I just think they're done. I think, I mean, and the beauty is like this new era of podcasts and these new ways people are communicating it and sharing that information. And while social media definitely has its foot in some weird spots, it's like it, it does connect us and allow us to share information. And I think there's become a lot of just regular individuals who have started to get brave and started yeah. to get loud and it feels like every week there's like a new like someone Voice. else is coming out with something or yeah. someone's breaking or, or just choosing to talk about something it's like oh we haven't seen that the problem is because i agree with you and i try to get my information from a wide variety of sources yeah. and i still read my husband gets mad at me he's like why do you read the new york times but i <laughs> i feel like i need to understand what is being written yeah. about and even if i disagree with it like it's helpful for me to understand the problem is one I spend so much time consuming content. It's not reasonable for most people mm. to read that much. And there's just not, you know, it used to be there was sort of a s single source of what we at least, what at least strive to be objective right. information. And there isn't anymore. So it, in a sense, it drives us further into our corners. Mm. Yeah, but then people just need to keep writing books and having yeah. conversations publicly. And eventually, I, I mean, I do feel like that the tide is is moving. I don't know if it's changing yet, but I feel like it's... I think it's, there's cracks. Yeah. And and I guess with all the, the disappointing parts of what's happening and the like wishing other people who are right on the edge just won't take the jump. Um, I think you're right. I think there's cracks. And, you know, one of the things I held close to my heart as I was getting in tons of trouble <laughs> for two years is when I first spoke out about the abuse in gymnastics, I was also just vilified right. by my own community, you know, the Olympic mm -hmm. community, the gymnastics community. And it took 10 full years right. before I was redeemed. And you know, it takes time. Yeah. You know, you might ask yourself, why would people get mad at you for talking about the abuse and support? We all accept that as true now, but we didn't right. in 2008. And I was seen as somebody who was trying to destroy the reputations of very good, celebrated, successful coaches mm -hmm. for my own personal gain. Right. And this was before me too. And it was before you were supposed to listen to all women. You weren't supposed to listen to any of them. <laughs> and so it's hard to go back in time, but it, 10 years and everybody came around. Yeah. It just takes time and persistence. And unfortunately, some people have to go first and bear the slings and arrows. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking some of those slings and arrows. And it's not that the, fun, I, I got to tell you. No, it's not. But I but you are. It was I know not only for me, I um, like our, the entire team has been like you've been a subject that we've just been as we're kind of digging in. And it's not been like we're doing this for work. It's like this is a like this is encouraging. This is something that lets me get excited again for 
um, for, for being hopeful towards the future. And I don't I don't want to become pessimistic. And I, I don't know. think as a citizen, I am of any benefit if I'm yeah. just walking through hyper pessimistic on everything. Being realistic is one thing, but yeah. pessimism is another. Yeah. And I mean, I fight really hard to try to stay positive. <laughs> it's really hard, you know, but I. I, it was why I wanted to write the book is just to give people like a little bit of courage. Like this is what I tell people every day. You don't have to blow up your life like I did. You don't have to risk your job. Not everybody can do that. You know, I was fortunate. I had been an executive. I had a little nest egg I could count on, although I do need to get myself back to work. <laughs> um, but in your own way, every day, you don't have to accept lies. Mm. You can challenge them and you can not be cowed by the ad hominem attacks that are just not grounded in truth and only meant to silence. You know, I don't know what that thing is in 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 your life, but you know, I I say to people in many in many places they didn't do parent teacher conferences in person for mm -hmm. like the whole last year. If you're a parent and you want that parent teacher because it was too dangerous mm -hmm. because of COVID. If you want to talk to the teacher in person, say I want my conference in person. If you don't say it, they don't know. Right. And too many people just go along. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's a million other examples. Yeah. If you don't want your two-year-old wearing a mask in preschool, you have to say it. Don't just go along. Right. If you see that impeding your child's learning and development, you have to say it. It's the consent of the governed after all. Yeah. And I think people need to do it every day mm -hmm. in their own way. Show up at the school board meeting. Yeah. Support that school board member who's willing to say the hard thing. Say, let's hear her out. Mm -hmm. we, yeah, we have permission to do that. That is that is our right. And yeah. we need to take it back. We need to understand our responsibility as citizens and don't. Yeah, we can't. I mean, I think one of the most helpful, courageous things you can do is just support another's right to their speech, mm -hmm. even if you disagree with them. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's it. You yeah. don't even have to take a position. Yeah. Just say, they hey. Have the, they have the right to speak. Let's hear her out. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Because if we stop doing that, it's all, they're coming for it's you over. next. <laughs> like it's, well, if we stop doing that, we don't live in a democracy. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't know why people don't see this. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I actually think they do see it and they don't care. That's what's really alarming to me. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people... Younger people right now seem very willing to trade freedom for a greater sense of safety, yeah. which is the hallmark of any tyrannical authoritarian regime. They will take your freedom and they'll give you safety in exchange. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Yeah, that's not a that's not a country I want to live. That's in. not a trade I'm willing to no, make. No, not at all. I know you obviously the book is is recent, so Levi's Unbuttoned is um, out for sale. Everyone, go get one. Um, but you've got another project you're, that's in the works. And so is that is that your full-time gig now or is it where all the energy is going? Or? No, I probably spend like half my time on this documentary film. It's okay. called Generation COVID. And it is, you know, we're following kids and families okay. in the aftermath. So we're, that's in the works. It's, it's in the works. Okay. It's kind of mostly filmed and starting to edit. Okay. Um, it's a long process and project. And I'm um, kind of figuring out, you know, I spent – the last six months writing the book, that was a, well, it really, I wrote in about two or three months and then making the film. And now I'm figuring out what do I want to do for work now? Mm -hmm. Like, do I want to go back to corporate America? Will anyone have me? Mm -hmm. Some seem very interested and then they get a little scared because, you know, people who say what they think are scary. Mm. Shocking. They can't be... Um, we got to change that. They Just can't be controlled. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and I'm doing some corporate consulting okay. right now. Okay. Uh, which is fun. I, I'm enjoying it. I forgot how much I like the work. It's really fun. And it's fun to work with other people. And it's fun to help shape brands. And I really enjoy it. Yeah. So I'm starting to do a okay. bunch of that. Yeah. Well, it's exciting to watch watch where you're going. And then also kind of this rebirth and like, I don't know, not a rebrand, but you're going after it gives you opportunities to explore other avenues and yeah i mean it's pretty i'm also i also have another book idea which i'm a little hesitant to start cuz writing a book is really hard and it's exhausting and while i was writing that one i 
was screaming at my husband, I'm never doing this again. This is awful. Because <laughs> it's really hard and I did it really fast. But now, of you course, You did I, it really fast, yeah. I have to say. I was When I realized the timeline, I was like, oh my gosh, like she just cranked this book yeah, out. Yeah, I basically wrote it June through August. Yeah, that's impressive. Which is fast, um, which is why if you do buy it, there's a few typos, oh. <laughs> which is embarrassing. <laughs> um, but... I, I want I have another book I want to write. I mean it's kind of exciting right here I am I'm 54 and I get to kind of build the second career that I want that mm-hmm. includes all sorts of things that includes making movies and writing books and doing the corporate and brand building stuff that I love so I get to kind of do it my way I love it whether this is uh, like your your permanent future or just for this period yeah. it's uh what what an experience just to get to kind of steer your own ship completely yeah after you know 30 years in a i'll call it nine to five but much longer hours Mm -hmm. than that Mm -hmm. job where your time's not really your own it's pretty cool at this point to get to pick and choose and do exactly what i want absolutely but i would jump at the chance i think i'm still pondering to lead a company and to sort of shape the culture i'm not ready just yet it's only been a year but for all the reasons I said earlier, as a leader in a company, you can make a huge difference mm-hmm. in employees' lives and I think in shaping corporate culture in that company, but then more broadly setting an example. Yeah. So I think that would be something I would want, I think. Not I sure. could see that. I mean, I think in the in the future I would dream of like we would you could be on the forefront of, you know, executive leaders taking on these not taking positions, but taking in the on these roles of, of truly leading yeah. by example and not because you have to think exactly like me, right. but just by like these are this we're gonna allow conversation. We're gonna allow yeah. uh this type of culture to take hold. Yeah, I think what's dangerous about not having a corporate culture, well, there's a bunch of things, right? One is you get to this sort of very authoritarian, <laughs> broader culture, but within the business world, If you create a culture where people are afraid to speak, it's bad for business Mm. because they're not going to challenge on issues pertaining to the business either. Mm. And you're going to end up with what what I call a guru-led culture where one leader makes all the decisions. And guess what? He's going to make some bad ones Mm. at some point and no one will feel that they can challenge. And most guru-led cultures in business fail Mm -hmm. eventually. So that's the other reason I think ultimately it's not going to work. If Mm -hmm. you don't have a culture of open debate and dissent where you're talking about the business issues, you're going to make bad business decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so whenever you're ready, I think we'd love to be right cheering y'all to get oh, back in that's there. And nice. <laughs> I'm so tired. It's I, hard. No, this has been a this has been a, a journey. Again, I keep saying you're still on it. I think this is uh Yeah, I have moments where I still can't believe this is what happened yeah. in my life. You know? Well, I don't want to take away from that because I think that's heavy and that's I think you're probably always gonna feel some, you know, grief in the transition. Yeah. But you've inspired me, you've inspired the team. And I know we're just a small group, but I think you are, it's, thank you for writing the book and thank you for writing it from your perspective so honestly, because again, as someone who's like, you know, from, from where I came and where I would like to be, like you were, I just, I was telling Stacey, I was like the hum, the humanity she brought to her perspective where I know years ago, I would have just written some of that stuff off. Mm, Interesting. And it was like, I just, it's like, oh, well, I may not even already like agree with that, but I have, it, it's softened. I can feel it softening to be like, but I want to listen. Yeah. And I want to understand as best I can. Oh, that makes me so happy. But I think that's really valuable. And I think you're doing that for people. And that's, that is what we need. And that's going to move us towards, you know, the next phase. And I hope I it's so. a, I hope it's a good one. <laughs> I'm going to maintain hope yeah. and optimism that common sense will prevail. That's Perfect. Well, thank you for spending your time with us yeah, and coming all the way out here me. and hanging out with us. I we know you're be busy, here. but we I'm excited to watch you continue with this. Thank so. you. I'm so glad I came and <laughs> had this great conversation. We'll have to thank catch you. up. We'll have to figure out where you're I'm going to be like when you land that corporate thing or, yeah, or the next we'll film. We'll stay. We'll stay in touch. <laughs>